be seated. I want to express my profound appreciation for this literally high honor of being asked to stand in your pulpit and proclaim God's word. Looking around at these uh, beautiful white Episcopalian vestments, it's obvious who is the black sheep Calvinist with us uh, today. I'm here with uh, my wife Dawn, uh, two of our three children, Eric and Lindsay, and a few wayward Presbyterians that wandered in today. Let us pray once again. Holy God, we've gathered here to place our lives in front of your word. So be gracious to our seeking of it, a word that can come only from you, a word that can make its way deep into the most protected corners of our hearts. We ask it in the name of the word made flesh, Jesus the Christ, amen. During the nine years that I served as a pastor here in Washington, D.C., I was struck by how many people came to this town because they really wanted to make a difference with their lives. They had a cause, a dream, a vision, maybe even a calling from God. But as I watched these parishioners carefully, I was also struck how often that dream turned into eventually a mean-spirited crusade. Crusades have never worked out so well for the church. Our calling is to follow Jesus, and Jesus is never on a crusade. Just before we get to the gospel text, we're told in the previous passage that Jesus has announced his plans to go to Jerusalem, a city of power. His disciples, like James and John, were very excited about this news. Finally, this program was going to get on the move. We're going to the city of power, and our man is going to be in office. So Jesus, seeing the eagerness of James and John, turns around, looks at them, and asks, What do you want me to do for you? What an extraordinary question. To have Jesus, the Savior, ask you, what do you want me to do for you? Did you tell them about the crusade you have at work? Or with your children? The crusade to straighten out family matters or the loneliness that's in your heart? James and John responded to the question by saying, when you take power in Jerusalem, make us powerful too. Let us sit on your left and right hand. We're told the other disciples were upset when they heard this. No doubt it's because they had the same agenda and they had been beaten out. We disciples have always had agendas for Jesus. We can manage Jesus' shoulders dropping just a bit as he looks at his disciples and says, you've missed the whole point of my ministry. The whole point, you've missed it. You still have not seen who I am. When they get to Jericho, a town that's about 18 miles west of Jerusalem, a large crowd starts to follow Jesus by this time, all watching with eagerness for this new candidate to take power, this new king to set up his kingdom in Jerusalem. We could all find ourselves somewhere in that crowd. We all know what we want, and we are all certainly happy to let King Jesus help get it for us. We're happy to take a boost. But Jesus has its own mission. It's not a crusade. It's not success at all costs. He heads to Jerusalem to fulfill his mission of dying on the cross, to fulfill our righteousness, and to forgive us our sins, maybe most of all the sins 
created by all that damage we did to others and to ourselves while we were crusading. All of a sudden, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, who's sitting by the side of the road, cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. The people around him try to get him to be quiet. This, this parade is finally on the move. Don't slow him down now. But this unimportant beggar just keeps crying out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. It's striking that this is the first time, according to the Gospel of Mark, that Jesus receives the designation Son of David. And it's a blind man who can see that. So it's ironic that the disciples who've been blinded by their own crusades have never seen Jesus for who he really is. No, it takes a blind beggar to see that this is the one who can offer mercy. The next few words of the text are, I think, incredibly important. And Jesus stood still. Isn't that fantastic? Why we keep yelling at Jesus for all the things we want him to do for us, all the ways we want him to help us reach our goals, Jesus just kind of keeps moving. But if someone in that crowd of demanding voices was simply to ask for mercy, it stops Jesus right in his tracks. This is one who just wants what goes to the core of a savior, not help, but mercy. To ask for help from Jesus is to tell him what the goal is and to tell him what, how we plan and strategize for him to be of help to this goal that we are trying to achieve. To ask for mercy is to place our lives in the hands of a savior, asking for his own goals to unfold. It's to realize you need so much more than just a little boost along the way in life. What you need is life itself. You need something that only God, the creator, can provide. You need a whole new way of living. Jesus may or may not help us with our goals, but he'll always stop and stand still before anyone asking for mercy. When my daughter Lindsay was born, I took one look at her in the crib and all of the crusading dreams began to rush into my heart for her. Over the years as she kept getting older as a little girl, I kept peddling these dreams and plans I had. At one point I took her in front of the Supreme Court and said, look at this sweetheart, someday you'll work here. Another time we thought we would try dancing. So she was a little girl, so we got her lined up in ballet classes and she put up with this, I think mostly just because she liked the tutu. But when we got to the first ballet performance, filled with parents, a performance that could only most graciously be called unfortunate. When the service was over and all the parents were, I mean, the, the performance was over and all the parents were shuffling their way out, behind me I heard one father say to his wife, well, sweetheart, there is always ROTC. <laughs> if, if one plan doesn't work, we try another. If that plan doesn't work, we try another. We just keep moving on, peddling plans for those around us because we love them, so we have to make plans for them. That's the way we think. But like all parents whose children become then adolescents and college students, a day came when I stopped praying for help as a parent and I just started praying for mercy. You see the difference? When I gave up my crusades for my daughter's life and asked only for God to unfold his own creativity, I began to enjoy her and she certainly began to enjoy me more. Now she's happily married, four precious sons. And although life hasn't always been easy on Lindsay, she's probably the happiest person I know. My point is, I had nothing to do with that. A time came when I just got to watch her life, to enjoy the mercy of God upon it and be grateful.
Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. That's what it keeps getting back to. Time after time, day after day, we can never say those words enough. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I used to love it when I was a pastor and a parishioner would come in to see me to voice a complaint. And at the end of the complaint about the service or the budget or something, this person would often say, look, pastor, I just want what I deserve here. And I would always smile and say, oh, no, 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 trust me. The last thing you want is what you deserve. What you want is what you need. We need the mercy and the grace of God. It is food for our hungry souls. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Notice that Bartimaeus does not ask Jesus for a few coins. That's what we would expect from a beggar. We would expect him to think that a rabbi is an easy mark. We would expect him to think that Jesus would want to appear compassionate in front of this great big new crowd he has. But if that was Bartimaeus' strategy, he would have just settled in the crusade of being a beggar. He would have just been trying to become a successful beggar. And that's not what he wanted. He wanted a new life. He wanted what only mercy could give him. So then Jesus looks at the blind man, and yet just have to believe he looked over his shoulder at James and John first, and he asked Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? There it is again, the exact same question he had just asked James and John, what do you want me to do for you? Maybe this time it was James and John's whose shoulders that dropped a bit. They were about to receive a critically important lesson. Maybe they got that lesson. Maybe they understood when they heard Bartimaeus respond, my teacher, let me see again. And Jesus said, go, your, your faith has made you well. These two men are talking about the exact same thing. Let me see again, your faith has made you well. That's what faith is. It is a way of seeing. A way of seeing that there is a Savior who is with you. Seeing that the Savior sees you. He sees you late at night when your anxieties keep you wide awake. He sees you when you're fretting over the future. He sees you in your loneliness when you think nobody sees you. He sees you in your concerns about your health. He sees it all. There's no question about whether or not the Savior sees you. The question is, do we see the Savior with us? That's what faith is, a choice to see. It's not a bunch of Christian doctrines you have to swallow. It's certainly not an emotional state you have to arrive at. It's an act of the will. It's a choice to see. The Savior is nearby. This is why I always preferred to do premarital counseling about six months after the wedding. It only takes about six months before both the husband and wife realize they did not marry Jesus. Not only that, Jesus is not going to help them in their crusade to fix the other one up. So now they're ready for pastoral counseling. And what I want them most to see is that Jesus sees them. He's with them. He's always eager to offer mercy. It's the only way any marriage ever survives is with a Savior wrapped up in its midst. A Savior who shows us how to be merciful as well. We're told that Bartimaeus immediately regained his sight and he followed Jesus, the text says, on the way. I love that. He doesn't know where he's going. He's just, he's just on the way. All he knows is that he's on the way with Jesus. I mean, I would imagine somewhere along the way to Jerusalem, he's got to be thinking that he's got to get a new career now. He's, he can't be Bartimaeus the blind beggar anymore. He's got to be thinking about family commitments. He's got to be thinking about his future. He's got to be thinking about where he's going to spend the night. He doesn't really have answers to any of those questions. 
All that he knows is that he sees Jesus is there. And in seeing that, he can see his way clear of all anxieties. He sees his life completely differently on the way with Jesus. It never really gets better than that for a disciple. Our contentment, our joy, our peace is found simply by being another day on the way with this Savior who is boundless with mercy. So now it is our turn to respond to Jesus' haunting question. What do you want him to do for you? The text today offers two options. Either you can ask for help with your crusade to achieve more, a crusade that will inevitably leave your life filled with disappointment and complaint, because once you make achievement the goal, you will never have achieved enough. There could have always been more. So you will always be haunted by disappointment and complaint. Or the alternative is to ask simply for the mercy that comes when one prays to receive their life, not to achieve it, but to receive their life. If you make that your mission, to receive your life from the merciful Savior, then your constant companion is gratitude, because you're now paying attention to the blessings only a Savior can give you. Achieving a life or receiving a life. It's your choice. Jesus apparently lets you make the choice. But just be clear that you're choosing between a life of complaint or gratitude. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.